Baseball is dead. Rest in peace. We got a loaded show for you today. Uh, I'm you. Yeah, there's a lot of topics on the docket for a Wednesday episode uh, where we just did an episode two days ago, but a lot, a lot has happened since the last time that we've met. And shocker, some of those topics involve our very own Oakland A's. There is a lot happening in the world of the Oakland A's. And, and quite honestly, there's a lot happening in the world of Dallas Braden. And uh, yeah. luckily enough, you know, we, we talked about, you know, oh, on the Wednesday show, we're going to have like a sit in guest. Our guest this week, Dallas Braden of the Oakland A's. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you. NBC. Thank you guys. NBC Bay Area, uh, we have the Oakland A's broadcaster to join us for what will be uh, an Oakland A's heavy pod. Uh, we're going to be talking about Biebs. We obviously have the uh, Blanco no hitter. Uh, we have uh, KFC console DeSizen on the Mets. We, we're going to blow Anthony Volpe because Yankee fans got up. Like Yankee fans just don't know how to take a fucking compliment from me. Like, I'm not saying they don't know how to take a compliment in general, but they don't know how to take a compliment from me specifically. Like their brains get confused when I'm like, hey, you know, great start to your season. Juan Soto looks awesome. He's a perfect fit. You should sign him long term. And they're like, fuck you, Anthony Volpe, Oswaldo Cabrera. Like, why don't you mention them? You fucking piece of shit. So we're going to talk about Anthony Volpe, a uh, little Mike Trout discourse. Why not? Uh, Imanaga made his debut. And um, I feel like Joseph, th this is a tough episode for Joseph to not be here after saying that Bryce Harper was cooked and then he hits three home runs a grand slam. <laughs> Um, so that's, that's all on deck Dallas, since you're the guest today, uh, you, I would like for you to pick the, the opening topic. Ooh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> opening topic. Uh, mm -hmm. you know what? Because yeah. I have this person on my fantasy team. Sure. <clears throat> and the fact that he fell to me so late yeah. is still a conversation in our draft. The disrespect. Let's talk about Mike Trout yeah. blasting an absolute fucking monstrous home run like 473 feet and visually i love when things get just abs like when baseballs fly over shit or when baseballs fly into shit yeah. it just looks it looks significantly cooler than just kind of going into the stands so when your eyes take you 400 feet to the wall and mm -hmm. then they take you 50 feet up and then they take you 75 feet back and then they take you 15 feet up to the top of the fucking wh whatever, the banner of the grill out in left. Like, holy hell. Like, nothing's been hit up there. Nothing. Like, maybe a side piece in extra Damn. innings. That's the only thing that's been hit up there. Like, so, good God. I've never been to a game at Marlins Park before, but I did take a tour in 2017 and kind of similar to what they do at Camden Yards where they have like the ball markers on the ground and everything. Uh, they do have like a couple of ball markers up in like that Budweiser deck there. But and you're going to have to leave the ballpark to go see where that fucking thing landed. Correct. Stanton has a couple up there. And if you stand on the ball marker from like some of those Stanton home runs and you look towards home plate, you're like, no way. Like, <laughs> there's laughable. no way that like someone could hit a baseball this far. Uh, but he did. And, and Mike Trout did the other night, 473 feet. And it was very interesting because I think baseball fans collectively thought maybe he's washed or... There were the trade talks of maybe he's gone. Jay Hayden didn't say he was washed. Uh, a lot of fans were like, he can't stay healthy anymore. He doesn't have Shohei to protect him in the lineup anymore. Like, this is it. It's the beginning of the end for Mike Trout. What a, what a sad story. And then he hits this home run and you see the tweet go viral. Everyone's tweeting out this clip of Mike Trout being like, man, I guess I guess Mike Trout still got it like that. Because it's not just, you know, like the the. The fact that he hit it 473 feet and he just it's it's Mike Trout. It, like he's a still that dude. 390 still that feet, dude. 473 feet. It's it's all the same. It all looks the same to him. So uh it was a very funny moment to kind of see the the baseball space kind of collectively go, ah, oh, oh uh, he is still good. Yes. <laughs> that Trout guy's still a decent player. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jay, hey, victory lap for you. <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm not going to do that yet. Um, <laughs> okay. It's it's really more about him playing the games than it is. Uh, I, I I don't th I think few. I don't think many people question his skill set. 
Um, so we'll see whether he can play, you know, a buck 40 this year or something like that. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, I, the only thing I wanted to add about Trout is that, you know, the Angels and the Trout situation have crossed over into like parody when and, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong. But the sentiment when Trout was hitting those home runs, he I, the the one in the first game and the other night, felt at least online felt to me like people were then subsequently rooting for the Angels to be as bad as possible in that game, <laughs> to get so everybody could make the joke about Trout doing something and the rest of the team sucking. Mm-hmm. And that to me is like it. It still is kind of funny in the right context, but. I don't want to spend the rest of an all-time great player's career viewing or or having it viewed through that lens by so many different people. That's all. I've I've enjoyed the experience so far. But yeah. is it fair? I mean, is of it Trout. fair to yo know, for sure? Is it fair to say though that we can all agree that it feels like we are going to watch Mike Trout remain sort of held hostage and by his yeah, I own don't, desire to an extent, you know? Yeah, I'm not I'm not doing the whole like trade thing. I'm not holding out hope for it. Like I I think I said I was moving on with that in the off season and not talking about it anymore, but like specific to how his performances when he is on the field, the lens that they're viewed from, like it it does seem like it's become like a little bit of a of a sideshow situation. Uh well, and he's way too just- good for that shit. Yeah, yeah, it just and that's why it sucks. That's why it sucks is because you don't want to have to look at what Mike Trout is doing through this negative historical context. Like th- that's not any color of a lens I want to watch his career through. I want to appreciate Yeah, cuz I think he's very cool far stuff. from Yeah, and I think he's very far from cooked as Jared alluded to and I'm not I, I was not on that bandwagon so like that he's playing I, well is not a surprise. I just wish it was um you know, and we'll see, you know, the Angels are absolutely competitive in the AL West right now, so shouldn't be burying them yet, I suppose. But yeah, that, that that's what struck me about the Trout experience so far this season. Dallas, do you think that Mike Trout has, do you, do you think that Mike Trout can finish top 10 in the MVP? Not can, but will. Ooh, um, we all know he can. You know, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I I do believe that. I believe he will be a top 10 finisher because I believe this is going to be somewhat of a, I, I believe he would like this to be somewhat of a redemption tour, which feels weird to say because what is Mike Trout redeeming himself from aside from being unavailable, being, being injured, not being healthy. So, so you take care of your body, you get your shit together and you try to get through a healthy season. That being said, I, I think Mike Trout understands that, yeah, like this is a dude that we know hears the noise from the outside. He just does a phenomenal job of not entertaining it to the extent where people are allowed to run with quotes and, you know, hot button items. He, he just, he does a good job of staying away from that. So I think this is an opportunity for him to say, let me just get back to doing what I do and I'll do it quietly like I do. And at the end of it all, people will look up and they will see how I finish. And if I finish healthy, we know what that looks like. And that's easily a top five, top 10 MVP conversation every year for the dude, every year. And just like, just for context, last year, three of the top 10 players in the AL MVP vote were from losing teams. Mm-hmm. So, and that, yeah, Jay, hey, that's, if that's he a plays great point. that being on a loser, if that's what the angels are, will not preclude him from being in the top 10 in the MVP. Because we would all I, I, like, I'm, and I'm with you. Jay, I believe BWJ is your is your MVP pick, yeah. Bobby Wood Jr. And which has we had that a similar problem potentially. Very, yeah. very, very realistic possibility that if he wins the MVP, that could be coming from a sub five hundred team. Yeah, I think I think the voting process has gotten past that because of Mike Trout. Like I feel like he was the dude that made voters go, you know what? Maybe winning isn't really that important to this award, and he changed the narrative. I agree. I agree with you to an extent. But I think that's because Trout forced the issue because of how overwhelmingly excellent Trout was. And Otani, like to some extent, that was he transcended his own team's record last season as well. But I don't think 
Like, I, I don't think his MVP candidacy is, um, it, like Bobby Witt Jr. winning the MVP or or Mike Trout at this point in his career winning the MVP is going to be a very uphill battle in that regard because he's they are not very likely to be far and away the best players in their league or putting up historically inner circle great seasons. Like you still have Julio Rodriguez. You still have the Rangers guys. You still have the at like Kyle Tucker. You still have the Astros guys. I, I just think there's everybody on the, like the, the multiple candidates on the Orioles potentially. Um, I just think there's too much other talent uh, not to mention judge and Soto to a couple guys for, on the Rangers. I yeah. I, 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 I think the Angels and or um, the Royals have to be 500 or better for those guys to win the MVP. Um, but to be in the five or 10 conversation, there's really no bar at all. Actually, yeah, you mentioned the Astros. I have a very, very funny story to share with you guys. Uh, oh. So it actually uh, I, last night I'm sitting there. I'm watching Red Sox A's baseball. Uh, it's, it's about 1230 in the morning here on the east coast and um my phone starts ringing and i'm like man it's late who the fuck could this possibly be uh it's alex bregman <laughs> so i pick up the phone I'm like what's up dog what's going on he's like i just had to share this story with you um he's like you know i've been working on my swing a little bit and uh you know we're looking at video and stuff going over um you know different points in my career of <laughs> my swing to like see like when I was the most locked in because um, I wanted to get back to a place where like you know some of my best swings like what did my swing look like uh, and we pulled up the matchup against you <laughs> the, the wiffle ball showdown and because uh, he's like I mean you know i dotted up fucking 112 miles an hour or whatever that was and uh he he said that like that's probably you know he was trying to get back on like a swing path where it was just like you know how barry bonds talks about it you're just you're catching the ball with the bat and uh he said that he looked at that and he's like i feel like that corrected my swing a little bit by watching that home run that i hit off of you <laughs> just yeah the, the sound just everything listen yeah so so listen astros fans uh if alex bregman goes on a tear it's because he went back to the vault and found the 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 sweetest swing of his entire career and it was the one where uh he hit a home run off of me he hit it into free fucking parking like they just didn't even charge people out there. Yeah. That's how far he hit that thing. Yeah. But uh speaking of Red Sox A's Dallas. Yeah. Yeah, there was a, you know, we're in the middle of a series right now. The sweep hasn't been completed yet, but that that game's at 3:40, so you got to get out of here at a certain point. Um there is a couple of different like I mean, first we'll, we'll start with the series and then we'll get into like the Ruiz stuff cuz that the conspiracy theories are running amok. Uh you there were a couple of moments on the broadcast last night, Dallas, that mm -hmm. uh, fans were pointing out. Um, let's start. Let's start with uh, the Tristan Casas at bat here. Mm. This was um, on a pitch six inches below the zone. Oh, oh well. Oh, got him. Struck him out on the outside corner. It's a huge feeling with runners on second and third. Low paint. I don't know how Cassis is laying off. <laughs> Slider dotted up, down and away from Alex Wood. That's a great pitcher's pitch. <laughs> pitcher's pitch. Maybe Cassis doesn't agree with me. And that was that was at least six inches below the zone, Dallas. <laughs> that was a uh, that was a pitch that was sorely needed in the moment, and mm -hmm. and they got the call. They got the call, and I was yeah. I was a little surprised that they got the call. Mm -hmm. You know, but so, sometimes, sometimes it's really, it's probably credit to Langoliers when you think about it. I talk about it, guys trying to blur the bottom of the strike zone and, and really kind of give those guys back there a tough time. 
deciding whether it's ball strike is that low is that out you know so i think really credit to langoliers there for just doing a phenomenal job of of wiping and and muddying the water at the bottom of the zone well speaking of langoliers uh Mm -hmm. he hit a home run off of brian (laughs) bayo and uh this is this shout out to the baseball is dead discord who (laughs) captured this audio him up in december and this is going to be there that pull side pop he's got a ton of it love that energy pass it on to lawrence butler what are you laughing at <laughs> that that jenny kavnar's mic is like you've obviously cough buttoned yourself <laughs> but you, you are cackling in the background and so loudly that jenny's <laughs> mic picks it up <laughs> what, you, what you laughing at, Dallas? I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm, <laughs> I'm not. Te- I'm not terribly sure. Do you have an idea of what I? What, do, what did you think I was laughing at? Uh, when 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 that when that came up, I I don't know. I mean, like, was it like? I mean, it could have been anything. It could like it could have been anything. It could have been how far the ball went. Uh, I don't. I don't. I genuinely don't know. I, well, it, I, I was. It, I was it saving go, it to ask you on the podcast. It, it didn't. It didn't go that far. It didn't go that far. It, it wasn't crushed. He didn't. He didn't get all of it. And I think I even mm-hmm. said that as like, he didn't get anywhere near all of that. But mm-hmm. you know, that's how strong he is. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll say this. Sometimes we have. I mean. We have folks who have been, who've literally been working in that, <clears throat> in that booth mm-hmm. on the cameras everywhere. And that's, there's folks who have been working there since the place opened. And there are folks who have been working there for maybe not quite as long, but 20 years, 30 years. And <laughs> they're just, they're fixtures. And sometimes, well, I have let it be known for, for these specific people, you you don't need to knock on my booth door. You have a hall pass. You can treat this just like your neighbor's house at home. You can walk right in. And if we're working, just sit down and I'll turn around at some point in time, I'm sure. See you're there. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have our talk when we got time in between innings or whatever. And sometimes those folks pop in just at the right time <laughs> and they'll have a they'll have something to say. They'll have a look on their face, whatever it might be. So I think that's probably. I think that's probably what happened is Got it. Uh, somebody popped in. <laughs> we had a, we had an exchange and, and that was, yeah. That was. <laughs> okay. It's good enough explanation for me. Uh, again, shout out to the baseball is dead uh, discord page. Uh, I, I will put it out there. If there's ever any more, because like I only get to listen to doubt. Da- like it sucks. I can't listen to you. I can't listen to the A's broadcast when I'm in Boston. I can only listen to the A's broadcast when they're not playing the Red Sox. Like there was one time, I believe it was when I was in Miami before we were about to interview A-Rod and the Red Sox were playing the A's so I could listen to Dallas on the A's broadcast against the Red Sox that one time. Uh, But otherwise, I can't. So if there's any ever if there's ever any Dallas moments on the A's broadcast that you guys catch, Please send them my way, and uh, we will be happy to play them on the podcast. Fantastic. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> there was one. Yeah. Like, I want to... Where is... I don't know that I could... Actually, you know what? I bet I probably could find it. Um, You son of a bitch. Like, there was... I believe it was that series. What? Uh, there, there... It was that series. I mean, it's 2021. Um, but... You were slandering me, I believe. Well, there's a few, there's a few Dallas moments, honestly. Figure out what it is that is preventing you from having the kind of sex, success, success, excuse me, that you know you can have. <laughs> Holy shit! This is the one I was talking about. <laughs> Are you a chicken finger guy? I dabble. I'm not a. Yeah. I'm not afraid to hammer a chicken finger or two. I've got a got a buddy of mine who I feel like he lives on chicken fingers and chocolate milk. Chocolate milk. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch! Yes. Yeah, Ouch! Ouch. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm sorry that you uh I'm sorry that you beat me to the video today. Well, you know what? You haven't beaten me to the video, but what? Well, the uh the Alex Bregman video. It is oh. something I like to post for you. Well, you know, he did say more than he, once a year. Just wait on it because he said he said if I get hot because I I like looked at my swing in this video, he's like I'll come on the podcast and we'll talk about it. So just wait. <laughs> wait until the Bregman interview. Um because apparently to, what, that, to, to repost the video. Yeah. Like with, when he comes on, we Dude, that video. Can, I don't know if you understand that video plays every day. That video plays <laughs> every, day. every day. That video plays all day. It plays yeah. on your birthday and, and it will play on the day that Bregman comes on it. It uh, the bat hangs in the uh, the man cave out there. He signed it. It's he signed yes. it and inscribed it rocket launcher. Uh, and then it has like five. Uh, still images from that video kind of in in a timeline form to illustrate just how far and just how pretty that swing was and just how far the ball went. Uh, but I did strike him up before that. So. Well, he swung and missed it. Yeah, I mean, but, that's. Can you say that you threw a fastball by the uh, second best offensive performer in the league in 2019? You can't. No, I was out of the game by then. I, I was never in the game. Still did it. Anyways, um, <laughs> Estery Ruiz. Say that uh, again. Estery. Estery. Ester, Estery. It's, it's a story. E, almost. Estery. Ooh, right, so close. Well, how am I saying? <laughs> You're never going to say it right. It's how okay. do you say it? Estiuri. Estiuri? Estiuri. Estiuri. Estiori, Estiori Ruiz, uh, was sent down by the Oakland A's. No one knows why, um, as mm. he was uh, on a team that has players. I don't know that that has many major league players. Through three games, he was hitting 429 with a 1232 OPS, and the A's were like, "Get this guy the fuck out of here, down." The conspiracy theories are uh he was wearing the last dive bar bracelet which it to to kind of provide some context here dallas the last dive bar is that is it similar to like kind of like the seven line with the mets it's it, it's like a yes yeah okay yes. all right it's like it's are, like a group of ace fans they're anti-ownership uh they do great no, no, work so, in so the community on. they raise yeah money that's for, that's yep that's what i want that's how that needs to be described first and foremost is yep. They do incredible work in the community and have long done incredible work in the community. And they have for a long time worked side by side with the franchise doing that work in the community. It isn't mm -hmm. until recently that the vibes between the LDB and the ownership have soured. So yeah. these are two groups, the Oakland Athletics and the Last Dive Bar, that have worked in unison together up mm -hmm. until recently. So yes. that's that's who the last dive bar. Is. So if you're a Mets fan, yes, it's the seven line. If you're a Pirates fan, North Shore Nine, the Renegades, it's the, like that's that's who you're. This is who they are. And there's yeah. also another group, the Oakland 68s. Uh, but the last dive bar is the group who, if you've watched games, you've seen them. They do a ton of different stuff out in left field, uh, different themed nights. But uh, yeah, they're, they're not just a group of fans who go out and get shit faced and scream and yell. It's much, 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 much more than that. Or it has yeah. been much, much more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, players were wearing the last dive bar bracelets and there are, none of them are still here. Uh, <laughs> so uh, they were either demoted, <laughs> traded, released. I mean, I, I don't think that like there's a connection there. I think it's more so with Ruiz. I don't think that he was demoted because of the bracelet. Uh, what what is your what is your take on all this, Dallas? And as as far as what you can say, uh, it, it, with your affiliation to the club, um, so like regarding uh, wristband gate, if you will, that and just like the Ruiz demotion and like what the and then the team's explanation, which obviously was bullshit. Well, so and, and I can understand when you look at the numbers early, right? We're talking about this was over the course of a four game. Sample size. He played three games. Three games. Mm -hmm. So I think it's easy to have a good game or two and those numbers look the way they do. 
And if you just kind of zoom out from that and then think about some of the conversations that fans outside of A's world might not be privy to, which is conversations about his player development and what they would like to see him do and how they would like to see him perform because of the role they are looking for him to fill. And you can't steal first base, Jared. You can't in the major leagues anyway. Well, Banana can, ball, kinda, right? Banana ball, very different. Very different. But you can't steal first base in the big leagues. You got to get to first base. And with his skill set, with his tool, it is an overwhelmingly powerful tool. It is a tool that separates him from quite literally everybody else in the game because of his ability to run. And it doesn't do much good if he is not on first base. So what did they say? We want to see him work the at-bats. We want to see him get on base more because we value him and see him as a leadoff type hitter. And we also need to see him or would like to see him hit the ball with a little more authority, because if it's in the air, it's an out and it's just not something that we think is sustainable. His success and how he was having it, they don't believe is sustainable. When you do not hit the ball hard and you do not get to first base frequently, it's tough to be a leadoff hitter in the big leagues. And that's the messaging. That's what they ultimately would like to see him go down and do in AAA is work on working the at-bats, figuring out a way to physically get himself in position to repeat a more authoritative swing. And I think a lot of it has to do with if you're having these conversations in spring training and you see the work getting put in and then one o'clock comes around and the game starts. And if you sense that there's been sort of a an, an abandonment of what we're trying to achieve here. And if you feel like there's maybe not total player buy-in to some of the adjustments, then, then maybe that move gets made. I've watched Esty grind his ass off. I've watched him put the work in. And so I can understand both sides of it from an organizational standpoint. Like if you pull up his baseball savant page and you look at some of the offensive numbers and you look at some of the authority at which he's is or is not hitting the baseball with, then I think that becomes apparent. So on the surface, with all these great numbers over a three-game set, you're like, how do you send down your best player? That's basically what people are asking. And I think if you, again, take a 40,000-foot view, you say to yourself, well, if the A's don't fancy themselves a competitor and they really are trying to be in the business of developing a product for future use, does it do them or the player any good to have him sitting in the big leagues and playing twice a week in a role that he can't get comfortable in? Or is it better served for us and the player to have him in AAA playing every day, working on the things that we're asking him to work on? So that's how you frame that. That's how you couch that. And that's what fans, frankly, just don't want to hear right now because of everything else surrounding the organization. Like the, the bottom line is you no longer have the benefit of any doubt, whatever it is, whatever the conversations about fans of the team and fans of baseball who are now focusing in on what's going on in Oakland. They don't want to hear any excuses and they are not here to give benefit to the doubt. Just, it's just, that's just the reality. Uh, and Oh, good. I, I just, I, when when you talk about like working on stuff in the minor leagues, aren't the A's the minor leagues? Like why why like I, with Jackson Holiday, at least you can say like, all right, we're trying to like win a championship this year, and like you know, it's obviously it's it's service time manipulation with Jackson Holiday, uh, but they can say, oh, we need him to hit lefties, and you know he's gonna see more lefties in the minors, whatever, like whatever. But with the A's, it's they're not. They're going to lose 100 plus games again this year. Who cares if he works on what he needs to work on up here versus down there? I, I agree with that question. And it's a question that has been asked. And trust me, you, you, and, and this is where as a fan, as a player, like as a teammate, as a broadcaster, as anybody around the organization, a, a writer, a beat writer, you have this moment with yourself and you say, I can continue to try to figure this out and I can continue to try to manage along with the front office. And if I continue to do that, I will continue to drive myself crazy because you don't have the answers to the questions 
So that means you can't really arrive at a sound final answer that's any more than just your opinion. So if you're not having the conversations with Esty and you haven't been in the cage with the work and you haven't assessed whether or not you feel it's going the way it should, then ultimately we're just fans. We're just bystanders and we just have questions because on the surface, it doesn't match up. And I think when you tell me that, or you ask me, aren't the A's a minor league team? Well, what I can say in response is what the A's have right now, and I said this on air last night, is a group of guys who have an opportunity ahead of them or are in the middle of right now that you just don't see in major leagues. You just don't see it in the big leagues, which is multiple guys having an opportunity to learn and to fail because there's just, there's not much pushing them or pressing them from the lower ranks. So it's almost like, a, well, you pick this guy to go down this week. You pick somebody else to go down next week. Is that how you're going to do it? And I know that's where fans, that's where their minds are. That's where the questions come from. So, you know, I, I mean, as, as far as a player development perspective goes, I understand where the organization is coming from, if, if that's their reasoning behind it. And from a fan base perspective, I understand when you have what is probably one of your most exciting players, if not your most exciting player, now in AAA. Yeah, this is going to sound like a troll question, but it's really not. Uh, are the crowds smaller this year than they were last year? Yes. By how much? Uh, I don't want to say a significant amount, but... Um, like, I feel like they were at least doing like 10,000. Now it's like six ish, seven ish. I'm going to, I'll say this, Jared. The conversation has always been well, things change when the Red Sox come into town, and things change when the Yankees come into town. And I think there's 5,000 people there last night. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're not exactly a draw right now. But the idea that you are a transcendent brand. Is why the well, yeah like and Red, the Red Sox, Sox fans coming like Dave O'Brien said on the broadcast that there was like whatever six thousand seven thousand people there for the series opener but like two thirds were Red Sox fans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, root 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 for the Red Sox. <laughs> I it it was yeah that's how the seventh inning stretch went. Yeah, so then I started drilling Red Sox fans with those little foam balls. <laughs> what was that picture? <laughs> That like a fan <laughs> sent in and we put it in the group text and it's just you screaming out the window. I was like, it's four games into the season and this man has lost his goddamn <laughs> No, I we uh the seventh inning, we throw foam balls out of the window to the fans, like all over. And so I had probably thrown a ball and then, you know, the last like I do a little bit, you know, I I'll have like two balls left, right? And I'll yeah. I'll kind of look out the window like who hey, one more, one more, and I'll throw <laughs> one. And then I'll, I'll look out one more, one more. And I got the, <laughs> you know, and I like, I hold the bag up the bag yeah. that the balls come in and then yeah. I tip the bag upside down and dump it out. Like there's no balls in there. And they're like, Oh, pissed off. <laughs> and I, and I, I lean out and yell at them. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's probably, that's probably what they had. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's funny. That's funny. I mean, you, do you realize that like you're going to become like the A's like Harry Carey like you're going to die in there like you're just going to be there f until you're fucking 85? Jared, if you were to say that to me a couple of years ago, I I would probably have a uh, a much more lighthearted and uh appreciative response. It's humbling to hear and I don't want to get all serious about it, but uh that would be a great thought, man. Um but yeah, you don't know what the future holds. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with that organization. Um, are there any other A's topics, Jay? Hey, before we move on uh, from our special guest, uh, his his uh, wheelhouse topic. No, I mean, I think you guys pretty much covered it. Uh, you know, I I watched the five error zero run performance mm -hmm. the other night, and that was obviously you know, <clears throat> kind of its own special viewing pleasure. Um, I, I found myself <laughs> watching a game to see if a team would make more errors, which I don't think I have ever done before. Hmm. Yeah, I felt so. I, I felt bringing in viewers <laughs> in all sorts of creative ways. You know, the new, the new, uh, the new Bill Vec, right? Instead <laughs> of a squatty hitter, you get this. Hmm. I thought it was funny that the uh, that the last time a team had committed five plus errors and gotten shut out in the AL was the A's. <laughs> what year? Two thousand three. That was a good year for the A's. 
It was. It, I mean, the roster. I went back and looked at the roster. It was a lot. It was a lot more encouraging, obviously. Yeah. That was, um, uh, but that was the. Uh, that was not the Barry Zito Cy Young year. That was O two. Well, Hudson was on the mound uh, for the game that I was talking about, but yeah, it was a uh, different I, I animal do, for sure. But yeah, I, I, I do just want to shed some light on uh, Jared Duran. Yeah, that fucking guy was an absolute. Still is a fucking problem. I don't. Three, three, three at bats, three knocks, three, three bags in fucking three innings. Yeah. Does the name Roy Johnson mean anything to you, Dallas? Uh, no, yeah. not much. Yeah. You ever heard of Roy Johnson? Nineteen thirty-four. Was it nineteen thirty-four? J. Yeah. Yeah. Roy Johnson. I mean, that dude is a fucking animal. Ball. No one talks about him, but we're mm. gonna talk about him. Because when you start to talk about the, the history books and the things in baseball that you think you're just never going to see again, you're like, there's no way. There's no way anyone can do this. Jaron Duran, this is from uh, uh, at J. Hey Kid on Twitter, uh, the Nugget Chef. <laughs> Great follow. Account. If you haven't uh, hit that follow button, please do. Uh, Jaron Duran is the first player ever since Roy Johnson in 1934 to have a game with three plus hits, three plus stolen bases, two plus runs scored, and at least one RBI. Who could forget Big Roy in 34? Yeah. And now we're seeing it all over again with Jaron Duran. Good Jake, how, how's this series been going for you, kid? Yeah, I mean, ever uh, ever since Duran broke that record, it's been... <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, Love Dallas's call last night. Obviously looking forward to the game today, too. Pavetta might uh might go complete game shut out yeah. on you. Yeah, I mean if Pavetta Pavetta went what? Uh something like six shut with fucking ten points. We just we're just gonna ignore baby Pedro getting touched up. That's fine. That's cool. No, he <clears throat> first of all, he sucks in Oakland. That you guys are obviously cheating doing something there. Yeah. Uh and he sucks in day games and somewhere in the world it was daytime. Okay, I can I'll accept that. So, I mean, he, he famously does not pitch well in Oakland. I don't know what it is. He's, got, he's a ground ball pitcher. He's got all that fucking, that foul territory. Don't I come don't to the fucking, don't, don't come to the mausoleum slopping that shit up thinking you're going to survive. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. <sighs> Just fucking take a ride calling. Bangalore's core. Yeah, Jesus Christ. How about Christ. Cora calling it a beautiful stadium? <clears throat> it is a beautiful <laughs> give me, stadium. Give me some of that. He, uh... It, it is, and, and he, he said this, and mm-hmm. I, you can talk to any player going. Oakland, easily, top three playing surface in Major League Baseball. Easy. Mm. Easy. Okay. Playing surface, Jay. I playing believe you. That's fine. Surface. I believe you. That's where, I, yeah, that's where I've left it. Listen, I, I've been out there. Surface I've, level I've, take. I've, uh, I've shagged some fly balls. I, I played some catch. And the old can call. Why are you shaking your head? You know I've done that. I was talking to Jay. He thought uh, he was okay. funny. Oh no, was, I did a bad. I did a bad little pun thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna say you're trying to take away from the fact that I, I've I've basically played baseball at the Oakland Coliseum. Like, I haven't played no. like an organized game, but like I've done the things that you would do in a baseball game at the Oakland Coliseum. That's undeniable. You throw so a ball I, on the field. Yeah, I can, I've caught a ball in the field. I've thrown a ball in the field. Um. These are things that, you know, average men can't do. Uh, I can speak from experience from having played some baseball on, uh, on the field of the Oakland Coliseum. And uh, I disagree. <laughs> I, I, I disagree with the sentiment. But um, sounds like Dallas, you could use a blue moon. Fuck, you're telling me, buddy. I got a fridge yeah. full of them at the Coliseum right now. Yeah, you're going to need it. You're, it's going to be a long year for you. Because even if you love beer, there are some moments that you want to enjoy without the alcohol. Celebrate those times at Blue Moon's new non-alcoholic Belgian white Belgian style wheat brew. It's for when you want to drink your favorite beer without the alcohol. Uh, I feel like you want to drink it with the alcohol, Dallas. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And I'll start in the fifth. Like, you know. Whenever. <laughs> yeah. Because that is an option. You can have you can have your Blue Moon with alcohol, but you can also have it without. And it's inspired by the beer that you already love, and it's available year round. A Belgian white, Belgian style wheat brew that tastes like drinking, even if it's not. It's crafted with Valencia orange peel and coriander, taste balanced and refreshing. 
Nothing compares to the great taste of a Blue Moon non-alcoholic Belgian white Belgian style wheat brew. Blue Moon made brighter. Get Blue Moon non-alcoholic Belgian white Belgian style wheat brew delivered by visiting get.bluemoonbeer.com slash Jared for delivery options. That is get.bluemoonbeer.com slash Jared. Celebrate responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. Non-alcoholic malt beverage contains less than 0.5 alcohol per volume. Uh, Jay, hey, to you now. Is there a topic on the docket here that tickled your fancy that you'd like to sink your teeth into? Oh, wow. Almost felt like we were wrapping up. That was so meaty. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man. Shane fucking Bieber, yeah. baby. Yeah, Biebs. He's back. Are you kidding me? He's back. Are you kidding me? What two, a layup choice. Two no, um, 12 innings, 20 punchies. We'll bury that no hitter a little further in the rundown. Yeah, because uh, we're because <laughs> yeah. we're doing we're doing Shane Bieber next, unfortunately yeah. for uh, Ronel Blanco. Um, yeah, so uh, Jared and I watched his first start uh, among other games, and Jake too uh, together. Uh, it was very impressive. I was legitimately curious how he would follow it up because, as we just covered in the previous segment, Bieber's first start was kind of a tune-up, kind of a minor league experience kind of an mm. exhibition game that counts. Um, second game was against the Mariners and uh, maybe like 5% less dominant, I guess. Uh, six scoreless with nine punchies. Uh, overall stat line on the season, 12 innings pitch, 10 hits, zero runs, 20 strikeouts to yeah. one walk. Um, a few other numbers like under the hood, just a little bit. Uh, he's got those 20 punch outs and 45 batters faced. Uh, which is obviously it would be even for him a career high strikeout rate and and almost certainly unsustainable for basically any pitcher. Uh, he's done so while limiting barrels, only one barrel in 166 pitches. A lot was made about his four seamer velocity in the spring. Um, take with this what you will. In April of 2023, his average four seam velocity was 91 miles an hour. In April of 2024, it's 92 miles an hour. So he's oh, up. Okay, you're, you're What's up? I well, no, I thought it was like 92 f- 5 or something like that. No. You're, oh, I, I think after factoring in last night, at least the last check on reference, I had it at 92 flat. I'll double nice. check that, but no, it, it's up at least up. one mile an hour, we'll say. Um, and then the slider, which to me is like, yeah, that to me is a bigger deal because, or as big of a deal, like, because I don't think you're never getting like 95 velocity or, or maybe even back to peak Bieber fastball velocity, I don't think. But if his slider's got that bend to it again and that swing and miss, I think there's like a renaissance version of Shane Bieber. And obviously we're seeing it play out Uh, two for 16, nine strikeouts. No pitcher has more strikeouts with a single individual pitch than Bieber has with his slider. Jesus Lazardo happens to have the same number, uh, but nobody has more. And he's boasting a 64% whiff rate with the pitch. I, from a aesthetics perspective and watching the performances it feels a lot like the old Bieber and the numbers suggest that it's a great approximation of the old Bieber I'm very excited and I know every every time I tweet about Bieber half the responses are he's going to look good in a different uniform won't make it the season on the Guardians whatever I'll cross that bridge when I get to it we'll see how competitive the Guardians are if he's on the team that means that the Guardians are very competitive in the AL Central, and he's a big part of why they are competitive. And if he's not on the team, that most likely means that they have dealt him for what is hopefully a really, really encouraging return of people, uh, uh, prospects relative to what they might have gotten had they dealt him last season, like a lot of people were pushing for. So that's kind of my Shane Bieber take. I'd love to get your guys' opinions having having um, watched two starts. I- I have one question before Dallas gives his his input because yeah. I am interested to hear from a pitcher's perspective uh, what he thinks about Shane Bieber. But I want your perspective, Jay Hay, as a Guardians fan, someone who knows the organization inside and out. Uh, do you think that there is a chance that this team sees what Bieber has returned to being, and because of the direction of the organization, they trade him anyway just to? kind of replenish and that's that's their major asset that they can get some sort of haul for even if they are semi if they're I'm not saying like in first place but they could be like in second place like four games out and they still pull the trigger anyway just because his value is so high and pitching will be at a premium I think that's absolutely a possibility um and I think they have something of a track record of doing that in previous seasons maybe maybe not with somebody quite as key 
as Shane Bieber or with quite as long of a track record with the team and with success with the team as Shane Bieber. But they they have been willing to do that before. Like I don't remember exactly where they were in the standings when they traded Trevor Bauer in 2019, but I don't recall them being wildly uncompetitive uh, in the Central uh, halfway through the 2019 season when they decided that now was the time they were going to move on from Bieber. So, um, well, I'm sorry, from Bauer. So different player, different reason for moving on, but same kind of idea as to what you're talking about, which is would a would a non-trash Guardians team or a Guardians team that has not raised the white flag on the season be willing to trade Shane Bieber? And I think the answer is yes. Not that I'm necessarily rooting for that. What's interesting right. about this whole thing is regardless of the competitiveness, if you are looking at Shane Bieber as the commodity that he is and could possibly be, isn't right now based on mm -hmm. what you were apprehensive about in regards to his declining velocity, isn't right now the, the selling point, isn't right now sell high on Bieber? Or would you think that that's going to happen later as the possibility or potential for that diminishing velocity to start to rear its head again and now here we are midsummer hopefully he's still throwing well but you could find yourself in a spot where his last three starts before you can move him so, don't look great and there is a decline in velocity and now that commodity that was so hot and so valuable in april slash may has now taken a hit has has now started to to depreciate so i, I you know i mean i don't need to tell anybody how i feel about the dude you guys know how much I love them. I, I would love to see this just continue. I would love to see it turn into something where the Guardians say, you know what? We think we think this might give us a chance to to backdoor ourselves into an opportunity into October. Who knows? So, so we're not going to make that move. But So what you're getting at is is trading them now, basically, or the idea of trading them now. And that and where I think where I think that conversation peters out is just the reality of operating and owning a baseball team. And the, the number of instances of a team trading a player that central to the franchise this on early. April 3rd right. uh, or, or next week even or whatever is, I, I don't, I, I can't search for that immediately. Uh, very, like very few and far between on teams what? that have not already, like even teams that have already What's punted the season basically to their fan base and to their roster. Are, are reluctant to make deals like that at this time of year. And teams are reluctant to, I think, on the buying side to tr to make those sorts of deals because those guys are still figuring out what exactly do we have on our team in a lot of instances um, and what injuries are we going to face three weeks from now, six weeks from now. But like if you're operating the Guardians, that to me, that to me sends a message to the fan base with six months remaining of the season, basically, that you do not have to pay attention to this product this season. And the Guardians are a team, like a lot of Rust Belt teams that absolutely, and that's not just baseball, that are um, where the, people will tune in if the product is good. And if the product is flagging, attendance will flag and, you know, uh, operating revenue will follow. So I just don't think that the, the, that is a cold, hard calculation sort of thing that a lot of front offices probably wish they could make. I would be extremely surprised if that's something that Cleveland is seriously entertaining until like we start to hear about it in mid, late May or early June when trade rumors start to ramp up for a lot of teams. And, I could uh, be wrong. Just, we'll see. No, if they trade him now, they better get the best fucking return uh, for, well, for a guy in his contract status that, that I've seen in a long time. That's all I'll say. Uh, to, to put a bow on Bieber's performance, 30, <clears throat> 37 swings total, 11 swings and misses. <clears throat> he threw the slider 16 times, or excuse me, he threw, threw it, uh, 21, 16 for strikes, seven swing and misses, five strikeouts on that slider. He's back. <clears throat> I feel confident in saying it feel confident in saying it even though i mean uh everyone in the red sox rotation looked good against the mariners but i mean uh, you can just see the stuff tick up with beebs to where i feel confident in saying that he's back 
Um, Kevin Clancy has already counseled the Sizen for the Mets. Kind of ties into a Mookie Betts statistic that I saw on uh, Twitter. Mookie Betts has scored more runs, 14, than the White Sox, 11, Twins, 11, and Mets, 8 for the whole season. Um, Jay, hey, in your mind, do you think that it is premature to say that the Mets season is officially over? A uh, quick peek under the hood here. Uh, Clancy and I were texting about this topic. I think I actually, a- actually preempted him a little bit and dropped the Kunzel in reference to the Mets be- before he was ready to debut it. And I think I might have sped up the wheel a little uh, for <laughs> yeah. him. You justified and, it in his mind, I think. But I, to me, yes. Like there's still plenty of scenarios where this team could like limp along to 78 or 80 or 82 wins and like not technically be eliminated in, you know, mid August or whatever. But I, there's also similarly like basically no path where this team is any serious, serious threat. Uh, to really anything. They play in a division uh, with the best team, uh, the best or the second best team on paper in baseball. Uh, They play with uh, another team that was, what, one win away from advancing to its second straight World Series to represent Mm -hmm. the NL last season in the Phillies and look similarly uh, formidable this season. Uh, This to me is just a very, it's kind of like the worst kind of team in that it's very boring and it's not flush with young prospects necessarily that I'm like, I, I am, you know, it's not a pirate situation when like Skeens comes up or with Jared Jones looking like he did or O'Neill Cruz where it's like, <laughs> I see what you're doing. I shouldn't have even looked at the computer. I should have just kept going. Um, <laughs> Got it. The, uh, but where you have like reasons to tune in on an individual night, like un- unless you're just like, you know, really into the Francisco Lindor or P. Alonso experience. And those guys have been there a while and been in the league quite a long time. There's just really nothing to see here. The pitching staff in particular is just a a complete mess. And I know there was some optimism about how Luis Severino looked and his velocity in spring. Don't need to bury the guy yet. He was terrible um, in his first time out and uh, he was terrible last season. So you know, a rotation with Quintana, Severino, Manaya, and Hauser uh, as your main representatives. Uh, it's a far cry from where they were last year in terms of interest level. Uh, and I just, again, is it the worst Mets team of the last 15 years? No. No. But it, it is in a lot of ways the most, one of the most boring and least inspiring versions. And I know this was supposed to be a transition season. Uh, they, they, they said that. Um, you just hope the transition occurs with like, a reason for the team to be optimistic or the fan base to be optimistic going into 2025. Yeah. Uh, JD Martinez signed with the Mets still has not played a game yet. He's kind of like still doing his extended spring training before he joins the team and becomes going to be a great primary. trade asset. <laughs> yeah, he really is. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's what that's primary. about. We can just 100%. call it what it is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Like we've seen like Chapman with the Royals. It was like just yeah, signing gonna... prospects ultimately is what that is. You're Correct. signing prospects. You're signing via... veteran prospects. Yes. <laughs> um, so Dallas, you you know as well as anybody that when you look at a team like the Mets, um, it's not like they're not talented. Like they still have ta- like they have fucking Lindor. They have Alonzo. They're going to add J.D. Martinez like Jeff McNeil. <clears throat> um, when you look at the list of things that have to go right for the Mets to actually make the playoffs or any team for that matter. Team X, we have seven things that if all these things go right, uh, we have a chance to make the playoffs. Those seven things are not going to simultaneously go right. But for the Mets, is there three things that if those things go right, because if you make a list of eight and you only hit on three, are there three things that if they go right, the Mets can actually do? Like, be, I'm not saying like win the World okay, Series. So what, <clears throat> can they win the right, wild so, card? Can they can they be in can they play meaningful games in September? We'll lower the bar to what three things have to go right for the Mets to play meaningful games in September. I, I think you're going to have to get <laughs> you're going to have to get at least average performances from two to three guys out of your four-man rotation out of whoever you're going to be running out there 
to start baseball games. That has to happen because you're going to have, uh, how do you get to arguably your most exciting player on this team? Well, you got to be, you got, you got to be within striking distance. You got to have a lead. If we're going to see Timmy trumpet come out of the fucking bullpen, you got to have a lead. Mm -hmm. So I, I think first and foremost, you got to stay healthy and you got to be able to produce out of the rotation because I think as Jay Hay outlined that that's a point of question. What, what, I, what do we have? I, I know you asked Dallas this question, but I want to mm -hmm. get in on this too. Please do. Um, the most interesting thing by far outside, like the, the, he's right about the rotation in that that has to happen. I don't think that <clears throat> those people are very interesting though, but the most interesting thing by far for this team and relevant to what I said about being uh, optimistic entering 2025 is Francisco Alvarez, in my opinion, because this is a guy we are talking about a former like top 10, top five overall in MLB type of prospect per those lists uh, who has shown like not nothing in the minor leagues, like a catcher hitting 25 homers in their age 21 season or a part time catcher, part time DH um, hitting 21 home runs last year and, you know, 400 plus plate appearances is not nothing. He's off to an encouraging start this year, obviously, in a very, very limited sample. Catchers take a little bit longer to develop uh, traditionally, offensively, elite prospects uh, tend to. So like that, that he's not a fully formed offensive machine in his age 22 season is not totally a surprise. But like he's the piece that makes a difference for them moving forward because Everybody else or, or the vast majority of other people on this roster are either baked cakes, right? Like we know what those players are and what they're going to be moving forward or they're players whose contract status make them like questions as to whether they're going to be contributors for the Mets moving forward. Pete Alonso, Starling Marte to name two guys that that's relevant about. But like, I, I just think to me, if I'm if you're counseling this, if you're counseling Decizen, um, to me, the reason to still tune into the games is to see what's going on with Alvarez. Yeah, because you're looking at a rotation where uh, no one is going to have a sub four. Like, I, I don't I don't see a sub four in there. Like, you're hoping to stay sub five with one through five, I would say. And then you look at the lineup and you ask the question, who outside of Pete Alonzo is going to have an OPS of 800 or better? Like you might have guys that flirt with it, but who can you pencil in outside of Pete Alonzo for an OPS of 800 or better? Well, you'd like to you'd like to think that there's a couple guys there that you could pencil in. Nimo, maybe, but like even like someone like a like a Francisco Alvarez, uh, the on base isn't there, so he may slug his way to like a high 700, but like he's not an OBP guy. I know the offensive standards for for Lindor have dropped, but I think if I, I think I know it was just 806 last year, but um, that that to me should be in the ballpark of what he's delivering to, because this should still Absolutely. be a what prime about fucking Marte? What, why is Marte this be not a prime. A... Why is Marte not a um, I have some concerns about Starling Marte. I know he is currently playing very well in 16 plate appearances. I think last year was alarming in a lot of ways. I know he had health issues last season. Uh, I'm just, he's, he's in his age 35 season. I think that's yeah, the old. easiest way to say it. And like, mm -hmm. I, I'm not 20, in any man. way disrespecting Starling Marte's no. career. In fact, I yeah. think he's been really, really, he's delivered more in his post PED suspension phase than I ever would have anticipated Marte delivering. Um, and his career, when I, we look back, is going to feature 150 plus homers and you know 350 plus stolen bases, which is going to put him on some pretty exclusive lists. But uh, I just to I count have, on him for much this season. I think is a lot. I, 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 yeah, and and I'll be honest, I I just have the um I have the bias of I know what was that 2021 when we when dude we what it? he did for you guys was oh, Jay, like it was stupid. It was he was the best player on the planet. That had been traded. It, like, like <laughs> it just wasn't even wasn't even a guy. He hit over three hundred. Like he he just did. Like, and that's what I think. Like, I think he had an OPS of like close to eight fifty or something like that. He stole twenty five bags in fifty six games. Too. It was, like, he was 
and, and I I believe that was a contract year. So fucking mm-hmm. props yep. to him. You yep. know what I mean for grinding yep. out forty seven steals <laughs> on the yep. season. But like, uh, you know, he's got forty two steals in two seasons plus. So even that part of his game. I, I just think a lot of his speed indicators are, are heading the wrong way too, and as they would be yeah. for and many of us who have hit our our mid to late thirties. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't even fuck. My speed, speed indicators are like way down. They're yeah. way down. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dallas, you got to go soon. Uh, do got to go soon. We got to do Blanco then. Yeah, yeah. we got to hit Blanco. Got to hit Blanco. Um, just to give just to give an idea. Because Blanco had a phenomenal outing, which we're gonna, which we're talking about right now. Imanaga had a great outing, but Blanco, uh, fifty nine swings for Blanco, fifty nine swings, twenty swing and misses, twenty swing and misses, twenty four swings on the changeup, ten swing and misses on that pitch. Pretty good. He had seven punch outs on the changeup, twenty for twenty eight first pitch strikes. Um. Yeah, that was nice. That was nice to watch some good defense behind him, crucial spots. That was that was fun. I didn't get to watch the game live, obviously, but just kind of going back and watching it. Like it. Shout out to everybody who was behind the baseball is dead account um, for grinding out this stat. But um, you know, BID was first, no big deal. Uh, mm. Saw that no hitters since no hitters since June of twenty twenty two. Astros four, rest of Major League Baseball three. Mm. Not bad. They got that secret sauce. Well, they did have that uh, secret al- sauce. Also, the earliest no hitter by calendar date in MLB history. Oh, really? Yeah. Yep. That's pretty impressive. Well, is that a? That, it's an interesting like, bit of trivia. Yeah. That that's like a calendar date thing versus like a games into the season thing. I believe so. Yes, because I think uh, Bob Feller has the that opening day opening no hitter, day? but I believe uh. opening. But I believe that opening day was several days after uh, Ronel Blanco's uh, performance, calendar-wise. Yeah. So, and I don't even think he broke Bob Feller's record. Um, I'm gonna have to look, but I, that was there was a, another no hitter that was previously earlier in the season than Bob Feller's opening day. Um, um, so, Hideo Nomo. You're right. Warriors? It was Hideo Nomo no, no, with the Red Sox. It yeah. was his first Red Sox start. Uh, Dallas, maybe? that is correct. Yeah, In because Baltimore. that was uh, that was yeah, because that was actually that was the Red Sox. That was their first win. That's coming okay. up or just happened. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, because that because that was I mean because that's the Astros thing about it's the Astros' first victory. Yeah, that's true. It took it took the Astros not allowing the other team to get a hit for them to win a ball game, which is a good maybe. recipe. It's a great recipe to win. It if you don't works. let the other team get hits, I feel like you Fantastic got a great chance recipe. to win that ball game. It's not mm-hmm. 100%. Yeah. But it's really impossible. But you can still do it. Uh, before you go, Dallas, did you have a chance to see Imanaga? I his sure, did. sure did. And um, what gets me extremely aroused about that is it's just, it's a fucking, it's a left handed split. Like you don't but you see, don't see it, yeah. No, and I just you know I like I it always takes me back. I'll always talk about this dude because I this was the moment I was like, holy fuck, that's big league shit. This is what this is what big league stuff looks like. Watching my teammate and former big leaguer, we were teammates in junior college, named Manny Para. Manny Para coming mm. out of junior college was throwing a hundred miles an hour from the left side, and he had a split finger that would wipe you the fuck off the face of the planet. It was dis- just disgusting. Disgusting. It should have came with a triple X rating. It was gross. So to watch Imanaga go out there and do what he did, 55 swings, 20 swing and misses, 12 so, on the split. It's just fucking gross, Jay Hay. So just, just since you just did those two back-to-back, 20 swings and misses, right? Yes. You said that about Imanaga, and you said that about Blanco. Bl- that's Blanco. how impressive. Im- that's how impressive Imanaga was. Is that he generated twenty swings and misses, which was the same number as a dude who threw a fucking no hitter, mm-hmm. and he did so in six innings versus mm-hmm. nine innings. Right, like that's that's the context there too. Like, oh, and there have me. only been 
this was the this was the thing I looked up about the twenty swings and misses because I had that too. Uh, there have only been four dudes to do that so far this season. It's those two, Scooble. So I don't. And, if you watch that start, that's no surprise. And yeah. and Jared Jones. Uh, those are the four. Yeah. They had twenty swings and misses uh, in a single start. So impressive shit. Yeah. And think of, and think about that. Imanaga just showed up. He's here for a while. Jones going to be here for a while. Scooble. Scoops gonna be here for a while. Like fucking love that. Love that. Did, did you bring up the four seamer with Imanaga? Cause that that was one of the interesting no. data points for me, which was that like I think the scouting report on him was that he was going to be homer prone and fly ball heavy. And he certainly was fly ball heavy. He didn't record a single ground ball <laughs> in mm. the start to eight fly balls. But but, uh, but, but there was no understand. success against it. Like 0 for thir- 0 for thirteen off the four seamer like yeah, that's you got to put that you got to and understanding the north and south game that he's playing right with trying to carry the fastball and then drop the split in off that that's so anytime you start to flirt with the top of the strike zone you understand that you open yourself up yeah, yeah, yeah. to being susceptible to getting hit hard but you also it's a give and take game right if you feel like you have a combination of the stuff as well as command that's what we start to call effective velocity. If it's not overpowering, but you can put it where you want, it's effective velocity. So he can put it where he wants and then drops a split in off that. It's a very tough tunnel to make a decision in. Very, very, very tough. So it, it was no, it's, yeah. a good, it's a good call because a lot of those high fastball split combo guys do end up being Homer. Like I know he's a righty, but Shill was a great example of that where like, you know, damn near as good as a pitcher can be in his league at his time also like led the nl in homers allowed in a given season and had like a decade long run at or near the top of those leaderboards so it's just the risk you yeah. take um mm-hmm. the the hope is is that those homers are solo right uh yeah. One of their competitors fell. La- oh, two of them fell last night, right? Uh, no, no, just one. Just the Yankees. So we've still got the the Pirates, the Brewers, and the uh, Tigers league wide unbeaten mm-hmm. teams. Yeah, Yankees. The Yankees lost last night. Um, the last time they started a season five and zero oh, uh, was nineteen ninety two. I believe they finished like twelve games under five hundred that year. Oh man. Remember, Jay, size large for that Bob Walk jersey when the Pirates are the last undefeated team standing. Who? No. Nope. Bob Walk? Nope. 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 No, I think it was. No, I think it was. Um, I predicted that they would be the last unbeaten team, and you owed me a Solomon Torres jersey. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Solomon Torres. Yeah, you like that one. <laughs> what a What a pull. Thank you. Thank you. Solomon Torres. Uh, he's not Julian Tavares, but that's okay. No, different. No, well, <laughs> not everybody cries on the dugout steps when they lose, or uh, sitting on the dugout when they lose the World Series, and then I cry too when I see him crying. No. Victor Martinez, <laughs> famous crier for the uh, then Indians. Yeah, there's been a lot of opportunities to shed tears as a as a Indian slash Guardians <laughs> player or fan. It's been great. Yeah, great I remember run. that. 
at a <clears throat> right. Cleveland. It has been great. Seriously. I got it. I gotta go. I I I, to, I hate to tell you, but I gotta. That's go. okay. All right, that's fine. We'll clean right. it up from here. Yeah, yeah. He, the fact that he you. said before we have to go, I was like, we that you fucking no, get no, out I, of here. I have to go. Yeah, uh, it's the Uncle best Phil of luck. We yeah. best of luck, Jared. Uh, best of luck today. I know you're. You know you're going after the sweep. I know it's a special day for you, right? Oh, hey, guess what? Guess what happened today? How many years ago? Huh? Huh? I right, come on. Come on. Oh, that. Come on. Do we do we sing happy Stop birthday? No. Do we sing happy birthday? No, no, no. I think no, we need you. to sing happy birthday. No, thank you. No, I'm good. Yeah, you I have think, to go. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna miss the I, bus, dude. I do. I, I do want happy no, birthday to you. Come on. You. No, come on. I don't want happy birthday, birthday to you. To you. No. Birthday to the rocket. rocket. Happy birthday. birthday. (laughs) That was good. That was a good rendition. Thank you. Oh, congratulations. Thanks, man. Shout out Padre Rocket. Hashtag leave it in. All right. Bye, Dallas. (laughs) Bye. Classy as always. (laughs) Here you go. Uh, I don't know. I, I guess, <clears throat> I guess all that's left. Uh, I had, I had the Anthony Volpe thing here. Yeah, we did sneak um, in almost damn near everything. Uh, we have it. We've hit on everything. Everything that I have here. We had the no hitter. We had Biebs. Uh, I had the Mookie stat. We talked A's. We had the Mets. Uh, Imanaga. Uh, I guess we didn't hit on the the Bryce Harper three home runs. But what else is there to say besides Joe is an idiot, he did it an idiot. Yeah, he hit yeah. the three homers. Um, yeah, he did it. Second He'd time done it in his once career. before. Yeah, was, that's that's basically what I had. Um, I like there are very few times where, like during like a regular season game, like you can just like be utterly shocked at a moment that takes place where you're just like, oh my god! But like that that grand slam, I I like dropped what I was doing to to watch it sail over the fence. I I was uh, because I mean I love Bryce Harper. He's one of my favorite players. Um, saw the first homer, saw the second homer. And when he came up with the bases loaded after already homering twice, I was like, this kind of feels like a Bryce Harper moment. Like if they, there are plenty of players in baseball where I don't know why this this is the first name that came to mind. But let's just say Pete Alonzo had homered twice and he came up with the bases loaded. I don't know that I'm like, I feel like this is like I, I already know what's going to happen here. Um, but with Bryce Harper in Philly. You know, on the road, maybe I feel differently, but it was in Philly and it, you're just kind of like waiting for the Grand Slam to happen. And then when you actually get it, that feeling of satisfaction and, and joy and elation, uh, I, that was a very cool moment, especially after Joe said that his season was over due to injury to immediately just hit three home runs in a game. Really tough look by Joe to dodge the Wednesday pod. Too. Yeah, um, I agree. After that sort of take. No, the only other name, uh, the the name that immediately came to mind when you said like the expectation there with Harper was Jordan. That's another guy where yeah, if he, he stepped up having mm-hmm. hit two homers, that'd be like, ew, yeah, bases loaded for a third. Let's do it. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, no, I'm with you. Um, to go to the Anthony Volpe thing, the only thing I had to add to to that was I think one of the conversations in the spring I, generated by him, I think, making a comment about it. Was that he wanted to get back to his minor league ways where he was more of a spray the ball around line drive hitter as opposed to a guy who was not selling out but going heavy for the home run, um, which he himself admitted kind of was the case as the season and went along last year. Uh, and that, you know, that paid dividends to a degree because he hit 21 homers. Uh, but obviously his slash line of and his OPS of 666 was well below expectations. Um, so the one thing I looked at. Obviously, his hot start's great, so all of his data is going to look awesome. Um, but what did stand out, which wouldn't necessarily be a change, uh, is that his launch angle is down from last season from 14.2 degrees to 10.1 degrees, which at least follows the storyline of getting back to more of a line drive plane and less fly ball oriented. So uh, I'm going to be checking to see if that persists as the season goes along. And uh, 
and if his you know encouraging start persists along with it. So do you that was my have hope, hope, you know. by any chance the average exit velocity numbers this year compared to last year? I don't, but I have uh, Savant pulled up uh, okay. as we pod. So let's take a look here. I'm curious. Uh, average exit velocity, 88.7 last year, 90.9 this year. So up 2.2 miles per hour. Okay. Um, so uh, that would be an encouraging thing. Obviously, his hard hit rate and all that sort of stuff is up. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I that to me is very interesting because he had it. He had a, if I recall, he had a pretty solid spring uh saying and doing the right things and his prospect status last year uh entering last season like was this this wasn't some overhyped Yankees prospect necessarily this was a universally regarded top 10 top 15 guy um so that he's hopefully building on like last season was it a success was it disappointing it's really hard to say you know, he went 2020 and kept his head above water all season, but was just not a dynamic player offensively. So I, I'm I'm super intrigued by him because they could really use uh, kind of another piece who's not an ancient person in that lineup. Sure. Um, who's productive. Just to catch everyone up to speed here, Anthony Volpe is leading the league in average. He's hitting 529 on base, 619. OPS 1501 and OPS plus 339. Obviously, we're talking about small sample sizes here. Um, but I, I don't even want to say after the season that he had last year because there were some good pieces. There were some bad pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some things where it's like, all right, if we can continue to grow here, then we can see the overall production kind of go with it. Um, but he's he's playing a very obviously well-rounded game at a high level right now. And uh, we did suck off Juan Soto quite a bit on that last episode there without mm -hmm. really mentioning Anthony Volpe, who is uh, better hitting, but he's hitting better than, than Juan Soto right now. That's fine. I think that Volpe took a backseat to Juan Soto in terms of order of mention on this podcast is editorially sure. justifiable. Yeah. Yeah. I'm comfortable with I that. Say, I, I would say that that's fair. Yep. Um, okay. I'd say that that's about does it for this Wednesday episode. We will be back tomorrow with the original starting nine crew. Uh, cannot say goodbye without some Jake's takes. Uh, yeah, just <clears throat> best of luck to Dallas today. I'm sure he's on the way to the yard right now. Um, can't wait to hear his solo call of a JJ Blade Day <laughs> home run tomorrow in a 14 to one loss to the Sox. <laughs> there were some, there were some tweets last night. that were like, I cannot hear or see yes. the name JJ Blade with that. It's like, it doesn't sound right. Like his name is JJ. Yeah, it's like Blade you're Day. missing a syllable idiot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. JJ Blade day, baby. <laughs> like they just, it doesn't sound right unless you say the whole thing. That'd be so cool. If he got it legally changed to blood day day. I mean, he should, it, yeah. it sounds weird. Like JJ Blade. Well, think of, yeah. I mean, I think we need to start thinking about post-career marketing moves mm -hmm. for Blade Day, Day. And he'll, he'll be on this podcast before you know it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe some sort of like, uh, you know, infant clothing store service, you know, like mm. J -Day, Blade Day Day's Bay Bay sort of thing. <laughs> it's a stretch, but, you know, it's kind of like off the cuff here. We'll get some real marketing people in, the, in on this to... Yeah. juice it up but uh one thing i did want to call out just relevant to tomorrow's podcast too uh four intriguing uh pitchers or pitching matchups on the bump later today corbin burns cole reagan's spencer strider is against the white Sox, which is more like tuning in to watch somebody get like beat up um like i want to see how many strikeouts spencer strider can rack up against the white Sox. that could be fun uh glass now against the giants uh obviously that's dodgers giants too which is his own separate interest and then george kirby some people's al cy young pick mm. uh against the guards um so i'll be watching that one for sure but big time that's all i got all right we will be back tomorrow to recap what happened on wednesday night slate and look forward to the weekend series that are coming up on friday uh we will talk to you then here you go.